Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee in 2022. Uh, before we begin, can I remind those committee members using electronic devices to switch them to silent? Um, our first item of business today is to decide whether to take item six in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Our second item of business this morning is an evidence session on petition PE1758, End Greyhound Racing in Scotland, which has been lodged by Jill Doherty on behalf of Scotland Against Greyhound Exploitation. Uh, this petition was referred to the committee following previous considerations in session five by both the Public Petitions Committee and the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to put an end to greyhound racing in Scotland. And I'm pleased to welcome to the meeting the petitioner Jill Doherty and Jacqueline Brown from Scotland Against Greyhound Exploitation. Uh, as this is the committee's first consideration of this petition, I'd like to invite the petitioner to make an introductory statement. OK, um, convener, members of the committee, my name is Jill Doherty, um, and as the convener has just said, I am I'm the chairperson for the registered charity Scotland Against Greyhound Exploitation. Um, I have my colleague and fellow trustee and founding member Jacqueline Brown with me today, and she'll speak as well, if that's OK. Um, so you've kindly given a bit of a rundown about the petition already, um, but we're here obviously to give evidence about PE 1758 End Greyhound Racing in Scotland. Um, the petition was first lodged in October 2019, having gathered 13,159 signatures, and that made it the fifth most signed Scottish parliamentary petition in history, which I think speaks to the level of support for um, this important issue. Um, the convener has mentioned that it was passed to the Clare Committee and unfortunately we then suffered some delays due to the COVID pandemic. Um, its last hearing was in February 21 at the Clare Committee um, and they pledged to put their concerns uh, around greyhound racing in writing to the Animal Welfare Commission. At the moment it is not included in their work plan and I think the intention of that letter was to invite them to, to consider bringing it into their work plan. Um, but we're very disappointed to learn in the last few weeks that that letter was never sent. So we're a year on and actually there's been no action so far. So that's quite disappointing for us. So we welcome the opportunity to come today and give some evidence and, and bring it back to the fore. Um, so um, I think it's important we take this opportunity to update the committee on the current uh, landscape of greyhound racing in Scotland. There's a great number of submissions uh, under the petition, but you may or may not have had the opportunity to read those. Um, so when we lodged our petition in 2019, there were two tracks in Scotland. Um, one licensed track, Shawfield in Glasgow, and that's regulated by the Greyhound Board of Great Britain, the GBGB, and one unregulated track, which is Thornton in Fife. Um, and although it has a premise Mrs. Licence uh, from Fife Council. Um, it doesn't operate under any specific welfare regulations whatsoever. It doesn't have a governing body at all. Now, when the, the pandemic triggered a lockdown in March 2020, um, both tracks closed. Um, and despite the restrictions permitting Greyhound Racing to resume just a few months later, Shawfield has never reopened. Um, so we're left now with one single operating track in Scotland, which is the so-called flapper track, Thornton and Fife. And as I've mentioned, this track is completely unregulated. And this leaves the dogs racing in Thornton among the most vulnerable in the UK at the moment. Um, the lack of regulation means that there is no vet present at any of the races, and that would mean that there's no uh, administration of first aid or pain relief to dogs that are injured. There's no vet present to euthanise a dog should it suffer a catastrophic injury, such as a broken spine or a broken neck. Um, there's no qualified person to assess whether dogs are in a fit condition to race on the day. No drug testing takes place at Thornton, and that's really greatly concerning for us because we know that uh, in Shawfield, which is now closed, but when it was open, drug testing did occur, albeit in under 2% of, of races. Um, but in those tests, there were 13 positive tests, um, positive drug tests in dogs in the period of 2018 to 2019 alone. And shockingly, five of those were for cocaine. So we feel that, um, you know, if, if that's the evidence that we have at a track that is doing only 2% of testing, it's our belief that the, um, the rate of doping will be much higher at Thornton and it's going completely unchecked. Um, there are no kennel inspections at Thornton to assess conditions dogs are kept in and we're both involved in um, Greyhound Rescue and we have uh, reports from independent charities that greyhounds are often kept in garden sheds. 
Um, there are no regulations uh, relating to how they are transported and held at tracks. Um, part of the work that we do is um, protesting trackside um, and raising awareness. And we have seen firsthand dogs arriving in hot cars on summer's days and being held in those hot cars until they are racing. Um, and I think fundamentally we cannot ignore the inherent risks of greyhound racing itself. And these risks are present whether the track is regulated or unregulated, and they cannot be mitigated against with welfare measures or cleverly named initiatives. It is a fact that making six dogs race at speeds in excess of 40 miles an hour counterclockwise round an oval track uh, results in a high rate of collisions and injuries, with the first bend being notorious uh, for causing the most casualties. The track configuration puts a strain on the left foreleg and the right hind leg of the animal, and this results in weakness of the limbs and uh, leads to fractures. But greyhounds are also seen to suffer much more catastrophic injuries through collision with the boards on the outside of the track, collision with the rails on the inside, um, on the bends, and collisions with one another. Um, the GBGB has been forced to publish injury and death statistics for its UK tracks since 2017, and it makes for really grim reading. Um, in the period of 2017 to 2020, some 18,345 dogs have been injured on UK tracks, and over 3,000 have lost their lives. Earlier this year, the Cross-Party Group for Animal Welfare wrote to the GBGB and asked for Scotland-specific figures. And so we learned for the first time that in the same period, albeit Shawfield closed in March 2020, so for that year there's just three months of data. So in the, in the period of three years and three months, some 197 dogs were injured in Glasgow at Shawfield and 15 dogs lost their lives. And this is despite Shawfield only operating one race night per week for the majority of that period, where other GBGB tracks are racing seven days a week. So, We also know that 200 dogs died on GBGB tracks in 2020, and that was despite the industry being closed for some time during the first lockdown. The percentage rate of track deaths is the same now as it was four years ago, despite some of the initiatives that the GBGB have put in place. This demonstrates that the risk can only be eliminated by banning the industry itself, because no amount of welfare regulation will change the danger of the track itself. Based on this evidence, we would argue that injuries and deaths are likely to be occurring at a similar, if not a higher, rate at Thornton. But there is no requirement for them to record nor publish this information, so we are working blind and we will never know. I'll just pass you to Jacqueline. Okay, thank you. It's not just physical harm that greyhounds suffer, though. Um, we focused on the figures from GBGB, and, and physical injuries are clear to see, but psychological damage is commonplace too with these dogs. Racing greyhounds are typically born in kennels and they're kept in kennels for years, sometimes in their entire life. They're only ever brought out for brief exercise and to travel to and from the track. Racing dogs are deprived of natural behaviours such as the exploration of the natural environment, socialisation with other dogs and experience of a loving home. With no opportunity as a young dog to interact as a pack animal, greyhounds often reach rescues with deep psychological issues, presenting as fearful and shut down or worse, highly reactive to any new stimuli, and that can make them difficult to rehome. If anyone has met a rescued greyhound, and there's many outside today that you might have had the pleasure of meeting, you'll know how regal they are. Once upon a time, before racing was invented in the 1920s, they could only be owned by royalty, and it's a sad state of affairs that we've come to this point today. But greyhounds make fantastic family pets. They're gentle, they're fun, they're sweet-natured. They're generally quiet dogs, don't bark a lot. They look big, but they curl up small, and they are very addictive. I've volunteered with a greyhound rescue charity for some years, way before Sage came about, and I've seen hundreds of greyhounds come and go in that time, so I speak from personal experience. The worst cases aren't the broken legs, they aren't the amputated limbs, they aren't the extreme gum disease that requires all their teeth to be removed. The worst cases I've seen are the, the dogs that are they have nothing behind their eyes, they are shut down, they are lost, they, they are just not present. They have such deep psychological trauma that it takes years to bring them back to being a dog, and some do not have that long. Um, I have seen dogs up to the age of 9 and 10 come out of racing kennels, again, very seldom seen the light of day. They do not have time to learn how to be a pet in a family home. We do try with them, and seeing them figure it out, and figure out how to live in a house, it is as heartbreaking as it is heartwarming. 
At the Eclair Committee on the 10th of December 2019, Mike Flynn from the SSPC acknowledged that kennels are no place for dogs to be raised. He was speaking in the context of animal welfare. He described the state-of-the-art kennels and sensory gardens built by the SSPCA to give the dogs the best experience possible while the long legal cases are being fought. Greyhounds don't have such a luxury of comfortable dwellings. A garden shed with no lighting or heat doesn't quite compare, and as Jill mentioned, that's not the worst conditions that we're aware of. So why, ban, why a ban and why now? And why do we think that only a ban will be sufficient? Well, we're aware that a similar petition was heard at Westminster on 28th of March this year. And the issues raised there are the same as the issues raised here, but Scotland's situation is vastly different from south of the border. As a devolved power, we've got the opportunity to lead the way in animal welfare reform, and we believe that now is the time to do it. Thornton, as Joe has mentioned, is the only track operating in Scotland at the moment, and it has absolutely no welfare regulations in place. The dogs there are at severe risk of having very poor quality of life, pain, suffering, injury, abandonment and death. There's no eyes on them at all. But it's more than that. As we've heard, the GBGB admit that tens of thousands of greyhounds been, have been injured and killed on the tracks throughout the years, despite the regulations currently in place. There have been numerous cases of greyhounds being drugged at GBGB tracks. Again, we know this by the GBGB's own admission, despite the regulations in place. We know that racing greyhounds offer suffer neglect and abuse. The GBGB have published these cases, so it's by their own admission again, and that is despite the regulations currently in place. We know all of this went on at Shawfield and Glasgow. GBGB have admitted it, yet there were no criminal proceedings. Any of the doping, any of the abuse cases, there's been no action. That leads us to conclude that regulation does not work, and we believe a ban enshrined in law will be the only way to protect these dogs. The timing is right at the moment. With just one track left, we believe the economic impact is going to be minimal of bringing in a ban. Um, there won't be many jobs lost. That's an argument we've had before for keeping racing open. That's not an argument anymore. There are fewer dogs racing at the moment in Scotland, so rehoming them is going to be easier at this point in time. As you'll be aware, the rescue centres are all full of lockdown puppies at the moment. It's really difficult. Um, so if we were to act now, we would be able to rehome the dogs racing in Scotland with no bother. In the time it would take to make changes to the existing Animal Health and Welfare Bill or Act or to introduce a new bill, more and more greyhounds are going to be injured and killed. We know that for a fact. To expedite this process, given the delays already incurred since the petition was first submitted in 2019, we're calling for a full government debate and a vote in the Chamber, and we respectively, respectively urge parties to join with the Scottish Greens and compel their members to vote in favour of a ban. To conclude, I just want to read from the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland 2008 guidance, which states, unnecessary suffering can be caused in one of two ways either by taking action which causes unnecessary suffering or by failing to take steps to prevent unnecessary, unnecessary suffering. We at SAGE believe any suffering caused to greyhounds through racing is unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very detailed uh, presentation. Thank you. I'm um, also pleased to, to welcome Mark Ruskell. Uh, Mark was a previous member of, uh, of Eclair. Um, so I'd like to, to welcome you to the meeting, uh, and uh, you're here to support the petition, and I'd ask you to, to, make, uh, to say a few words, Mark. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, convener. You, you'll be well aware of the discussions in this petition in the, in the previous um, committee. Um, I wanted to give the, the committee, this committee, just a little bit of context here. Um, the Animal Welfare Act was passed in this parliament back in uh, 2006. And, and the act does place a, a duty of care on all those people who keep animals or pet owners um, to protect those animals from suffering injury and disease. Those are the words that are in the act. And I was on that committee uh, in session two uh, when it was going through and we were, we were scrutinising the, uh, the bill. And the issue of, of racing greyhounds was discussed very briefly, but it was discussed. And I think the consensus on the committee at the time was that the provisions within the bill that we were, that we were examining should have been enough to really drive welfare improvements across society and, and in particular uh, in relation to greyhounds as well. That, that was the, the belief back then. Um, but I think, you know, looking at where we're at now, a decade and a half later, 
um, the evidence shows that, that we're not seeing that improvement with racing greyhounds. Um, I mean, it's clear that instead of them being protected um, from suffering an injury, they're actually increasingly being subjected to suffering an, in, an injury. And I think the figures that the petitioners highlight um, really, really demonstrate that, the increased numbers of deaths, increased number of, of injuries. And I think that, that's at a time when, you know, we've seen increased scrutiny of the industry as well. And, and I think, to be fair to the industry, they have attempted to reform. They've put in place uh, what they call a greyhound commitment as an attempt to try and uh, increase welfare standards. But all of this seems to have completely failed. Uh, the figures, the injuries, the suffering are going in the wrong direction. Um, so I, I, I support this petition because I, I genuinely think that this is an industry that is really beyond reform. Uh, and I think it comes back to the inherent risks in greyhound racing that the petitioners outlined. We're talking about dogs going around a track at 40 miles an hour, the, the inherent risks in terms of collisions between dogs, between the, the dogs and the, and the track infrastructure is, is there. So I think it, it raises not just serious welfare questions about how we treat and deal with the injuries that arise from uh, greyhounds racing, but also major ethical considerations about why are we actually putting dogs into that situation in the first place. No, knowing full well that they're going to have uh, an increased risk of, of injury and, and death. It's a major ethical consideration as well as a welfare one. And I think on, on that basis, <coughs> convener, it does remind me um, of some of the considerations we had in the last session about the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Bill, um, because there are, there are parallels here. We're at a situation where there is next to no industry, uh, greyhound industry in Scotland, just as there was with the, uh, the circus industry that, that was using wild animals and travelling circuses. So it appears that a ban would result in, in virtually no economic impact in Scotland. Uh, and we're also seeing widespread gathering uh, support for a ban on greyhound racing. And I think very significantly um, last week, the, the SSPCA uh, came out uh, in favour of a ban. And, and I think you know, that was very welcome. But it's also, I'm aware that the SSPCA has been very patient with this industry over a long period of time and has worked closely with them. So for them to come to that conclusion that a ban should be put in place, I think is significant. Um, in terms of the, the next steps that the, the committee may, may consider, I mean, clearly writing to the Animal Welfare Commission is, um, is aggressively over, overdue and, and I think should be done, but I'm also aware that the Animal Welfare Commission has got a very busy uh, work programme at the moment. Uh, I think the time for scrutiny is now. We're seeing scrutiny in the Welsh Senate. We're seeing scrutiny at Westminster on this issue. I think it's time for this Parliament to take a lead as well, and this session this morning is, is very welcome. Uh, I, I think if more evidence was taken, particularly oral evidence, that might if I could suggest perhaps provide a better evidence base to then write to the Scottish Government and, and actually get a clear position, because I think the Government is referring back to the Animal Welfare Act 2006, which, as I think we've heard today, is, is, is not working for greyhounds. It's not driving the welfare improvements um, that we really need to see. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we're going to move to questions from members now. I'm going to kick off. Uh, and, and my first question is going to be to you, Mark, but I'd like uh, Jill to come in in the back of it. You, you wrote to Marie Goujon um, back in, in March of, of this year, and, and, and the, the Cabinet Secretary suggested that the provisions within the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 20, eh, 2006 were adequate. So are we in a position where the laws are actually in place, but they're just not being enforced, or there's not the capacity for for the, the appropriate body to, to intervene and, and act. Where, where is it going wrong? Um, be, have you any idea? Why do the government think it's, it's fit for purpose, but you're suggesting and uh, well, I, I Scotland again... Well, it would be a, a service for the government to, to actually get evidence from a parliamentary committee that, that's doing a, a deep dive in, into this issue and to really un, unpack what those issues are. Um, and I think that would help to inform the view of, of the government on this. I, I do come back to the point I made, though, that I think there are inherent risks here in, in putting dogs around a track at 40 mile an hour with a high collision risk. I think it's very difficult, if not impossible, to protect, to quote the Act again, uh, to protect animals from suffering and injury uh, in that situation. Um, but I think the petitioners may have thoughts as to how some of the enforcement issues 
have been very difficult for the SSPCA and others to, to follow up on. Um, in terms of the, the strict legal provisions within the Act and the issues around doping and, and, and clear-cut abuses of, of animal welfare. So, so, Jill, do you think is there a reluct reluctance to, to ensure that the Act, that the law is, is followed, or is there difficulties? There's a lack of capacity. Why are we seeing it? I would working? say there's a, a purposeful obstruction of, of achieving that uh, from the industry. Um, Unfortunately, what I would like to talk about is what happens at Thornton, but we are completely blind there because there is no regulatory body. So I can't sit here and tell you why Thornton are failing because we have no idea how many dogs are doped, injured, killed. We also don't have any traceability of those dogs. So dogs racing on um, registered tracks are traced through their ear tattoos and we can, if it's, it's again difficult and the GBGB is quite obstructive in the way that they present their information, but you could theoretically find this dog um, has these earmarks. Where is that dog now? Was it, was it injured? Was it killed? There's none of that at Thornton. So all I can speak to is what we know from GBGB tracks, albeit we no longer have one. Um, but the process, the GBGB is obviously entrusted to, um, to manage their own um, affairs in-house. And um, as, as we've mentioned, the belief at the moment of the government seems to be that they're doing an adequate job. Um, if a dog, um, let's look at one of those um, instances where a dog is found to have been drugged by, uh, with cocaine, and that's done to try and um, influence the outcome of the race and make more money, basically, that, which is what this industry comes down to. Um, it's, it's money and it's a, a bit of entertainment for some people on a Saturday night. Um, but let's say a dog is um, tested positive for cocaine today. Um, we don't learn about that until three, four, maybe five months later. It's published at the very back of an online journal buried deep within the GBGB um, website. So we scour those uh, journals every week when they come out um, and we'll learn, OK, back five months ago, this trainer um, drugged this dog. Um, that, that has not been reported to the SSPCA or to Police Scotland because whenever we see these coming up in the journals, we phone the police and we report it to the police and to the SSPCA and they are not aware of these um, issues. So, um, and then it's five months on, so the dog is no longer there. Um, maybe the trainer has moved to a different track. There is no evidence to collect anymore. So the GBGB doesn't work with the authorities to ensure that there are prosecutions made, which um, my colleague said, uh, explained to you, there have been no prosecutions um, because they don't work with the, the, the SSPC and they don't work with the police. Um, even when they publish their injury and death statistics, um, they don't break it down by tracks. So you can't ascertain well which, which, which are the dangerous tracks. They, they, there is a purposeful effort um, to obstruct um, our ability to scrutinise the industry from the outside. And it's worth mentioning as well that all of the information we have is, is from the GBGB themselves. So it's not an independent body that looks at the numbers of injuries, deaths, doping, all of these things. Um, so we're working on trust. But Personally, I have no trust because of the way in which they do these things to ensure that the scrutiny is not there. Um, and I think that's exactly why the SSPC have changed their decades-long held stance. And they're saying, we just need to ban it because we can't get in, we can't investigate, we can't make prosecutions. Um, it's no use us learning that five months ago a dog was drugged with cocaine and had a heart attack um, because it, you know, it's, it's not contemporaneous information and there's no evidence to collect. Um, so I think that's why they've said enough is enough. Thank you. Alistair Allen to follow with Jim Fairley. Thank you, Convener. Um, you, you've mentioned some of the limitations of the, the GBGB regulation that there is, um, but obviously the, the one track that we have is, is unregulated just now. So I'm just interested to know what you have been able to do as an organisation to find out why Fife is, 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 is licensing an unregulated track. Now, I appreciate that there may be a legal side to this that I know nothing about in terms of the powers that Fife Council does and doesn't have. I'm just curious to know what contact you've had with Fife Council about these issues. Yeah, we um, submitted a Freedom of Information request earlier this year asking specifically about the conditions the dogs were kept in as well as various other questions. Um, we've referred to it in our submission that we, we put in recently. Um, there is no requirement for them to be licensed. Um, we actually do not understand how Thornton can operate 
under the current legislation and be said to be complying with it, because to us it doesn't make sense. Um, basically, they have a premises licence, and I believe that does that enable them to sell alcohol. Um, they haven't had any health and safety inspections for over a decade. Um, basically, nobody has eyes on them. Uh, I suppose our concern is that the Thornton Stadium is open to the public. They're sell serving food, they're serving drinks, they're promoting their, their stadium, they're publicising it at the moment, trying to draw more people in. But there's no requirement for any of these checks to be done under current legislation or regulations, and that's a real concern. As to how that's come about, I can't answer. No, you'll, you'll yeah. operate the mic. Thanks, Convener. Um, Jacqueline, I think you already answered this earlier on, but there are a couple of just technical things I'll ask. You say there's no vets attendance at Thornton, um, and you went through a list of things that would be checked at a regulated track. Does that always happen at a regulated track? A complete vet check before we go to a race? Um, what we know is that legally on a GBGB track, there must be a vet present. Um, whether they are hands-on checking the animals, I don't know. Um, what tends to happen is that you can only attract a vet that is a, a pro-racing vet, because a vet, veterinarian that feels that greyhound racing is, uh, is cruel wouldn't work at a track. So, um, it's, it's someone who's got a vested interest in, in the industry, but a vet has to be present. We assume that any vet uh, with a conscience would be checking to make sure that dogs are fit and things like that. I think the reason that we hark back to what the situation is with these registered tracks in terms of a vet being present is to demonstrate that um, we're trying to guard against... Uh, the government wanting to put in similar legislation for flapper tracks, because what we're demonstrating here is even with that... What's a flapper track? Oh, apologies. So that's, that's what is uh, the term for these un uh, unregulated tracks. Okay. So there's only one in Scotland, one in England and one in Wales. Okay. And as Jacqueline said, it's, it's kind of a, a curiosity to us that it, it has happened. There have been historically tens and tens of flapper tracks um, where you, you don't need to be a professional greyhound trainer. You can just put your greyhound in the back of your car and tip up and race. So apologies. That, a flapper track is, is what Thornton is where there's no uh, regulation in place, so they're working um, with, with no kind of scrutiny. OK. I think you answered this already. If somebody turns up with a dog that is, for one reason or another, unfit to race, yep. or it's found to be um, doped, or some other thing that you, you highlighted earlier on, are you saying that there is no consequence to the person who's turned up with that dog for having done it. So it's not as though they are banned from that track. It's not as though they're not allowed to race again. There is no legislation in place that would stop them from racing as a result of a misdemeanor. Um, on a flapper track? Absolutely not. There's no... What about, uh, on what a, about the On the registered track? track? Bear in mind, we don't have one of those anymore, but I, I'll answer the question. On a registered track, we are leaving it to the GBGB to self-regulate in-house. And so that's, you know, it's, it's for them to decide. They'll have a hearing um, and they'll decide what the fate is of that trainer. And yes, in a, a small number of cases, the trainer will be uh, suspended or fined or uh, banned. Um, we find that that's quite rare. Um, but what tends to happen is in these hearings, for example, one of the um, there was one hearing that was written up four months later on. Um, the trainer said that the greyhound must have uh, picked up the licked cocaine off of um, the back of the van, and he was carrying um, a friend that, that previously that might have had cocaine on his person. Um, and the GBGB um, has a, a choice to accept that evidence. So. If the GBGB wanted to demonstrate that they were upholding the um, Animal Health and Welfare Act, then they would immediately, uh, on, on getting that positive for cocaine, pick up the phone and phone the, the SSPC and Police Scotland and make it a, a criminal matter, because it is. And then that would offer... Um, you know, that would give them the power to come in and investigate it properly. We're, we're leaving it to the industry to self-regulate, and plainly it's not working if we're seeing these things happening. One very brief observation. If you've got a vet who is pro-racing, surely a vet who is not comfortable with racing would be a far better vet 
to be at a greyhound track so that they're actually looking for these problems. And one very final thing yourself, Jacqueline, you're surely not saying that it's only royals that should be keeping greyhounds. <laughs> not these days, no, no. no. But it Thank does you. give a good indication as to how greyhounds were viewed in the past, <laughs> certainly, and it is quite sad that we've got to this point. Uh, Mercedes for Alba. Thank you, and good morning. Thanks very much for coming uh, to speak to us today. Um, Jill, you explained that the Thornton track is unregulated, but it is licensed by Fife Council. So I just had a follow-up from Alistair's question. So I'm assuming that if Fife Council were to revoke that licence, then that would mean that the track would have to close. So I was wondering if your organisation has written to Fife Council to request that they revoke the licence, or that they attach a condition to the licence requiring it to be re requiring the track to be regulated. Um, and, and yeah, if you've done that, and if you've had any response from them to that. Well, I can answer that just on the back of the FOI. Um, basically, uh, Fife Council came back telling us that it's the SSPCA's responsibility for the safety of the dogs at Thornton. So SSPCA, um, as far as we're aware, haven't been anywhere near it. Um, but there's a bit of, it feels like there's a bit of game playing, to be honest, because when we ask Fife Council, it's like nothing to do with us. And yet the SSPCA aren't involved, the GBGB is nowhere. And that's why we keep coming back to saying nobody has eyes on these dogs at the moment. Everyone's shunning responsibility and saying it's someone else's responsibility. But I want to beat the point that Jill's made. Ultimately, regulation doesn't work. Um, Self-regulation is, it can't work. It's in the, the industry's interests to present the best information possible. So given some of the practices we know to go on in the industry, we struggle to trust the figures that they give us and we suspect injuries and deaths are actually far higher. And actually, if you look at any media over the last decade, you'll find countless stories being published about mass graves of greyhound bodies, greyhounds having their ears cut off and being discarded so they can't be identified. It's, it's rife basically throughout the country. Um, and it's shocking that Fife Council has no place in that, neither, it seems, does the SSPCA. I'm not sure, Mark, if you wanted to um, come back on... I don't know if I'm allowed to ask you questions, actually, well, um, sorry. Yeah, everybody else is. Um, no, th th yes, I mean, I think, I think the, the FOIs that have come back just show the limits of what you can do through premises licensing and alcohol licensing, you know, the, those, those licensing frameworks are set by legislation that is very specific to the, to the issues that need to be dealt with. So uh, I think the challenge is a Fife Council, even if it wanted to, trying to regulate um, a greyhound racing track for all of the concerns and issues that have been raised here today using another form of licensing it, it, is just a, a contortion. It, it makes it very, very difficult for Vive Council to be able to do that, which is, which is the gap that I think that, that the petitioners are raising, that we just don't have the right tools, be it through the Animal Welfare Act, through it, premises licensing, in order to um, ensure the safety of, of animals. Thanks, that's helpful. And Burgess and then Rachel Hamilton, please. Thanks, Convener. I've got a few questions. Um, I'm going to first start with, Mark, you said uh, in your statement that there's virtually no industry in Scotland. And uh, I wondered if you could, I mean, and I've, and I read in the papers that, for example, greyhounds were initially raised in Ireland, I believe. And um, so maybe you could expand on that. I, mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm beginning to get a picture that it's a cross-border industry and dogs come from elsewhere to race at Thornton. But if you could explain that a bit more. It might be better, yeah, actually, for, for, for Jill to um, expand on that. So, once again, I, I can tell you what I know from a registered track because we have some limited information. Um, so, we, we know from your tattoos that around 80%, if not more, of the greyhound racing in Scotland and the rest of the UK come from Ireland. Um, it is bigger business in Ireland and a lot of the breeding happens in Ireland, although not exclusively. Um, and so, yes, the, the, kind of, uh, the flow of dogs does come from, from Ireland uh, to race in Scotland. Um, we don't know if that is the case in Thornton, but it is the case everywhere else. Um, but there's no traceability of those dogs. We have no idea which dogs are racing. And we also don't know how frequently they're, they're being raced. Um, so there are some limited um, rules about not over racing dogs if it's on a GBGB track. And we check the rear tattoos so we know how many times they're racing, um, albeit frequently they breach their own rules on that. But <clears throat> dogs could be raced at Thornton on a Saturday and then taken across the border to Newcastle the next day and raced and raced. So, um, 
yeah, there's. Um, there is uh, some uh, some feed of dogs from Ireland. There's very little breeding that we're aware of in Scotland at all. Um, I think if you lift the, the last tiny bit of greyhound racing that we have in Scotland out of the equation, um, the, the industry has kind of folded in on itself already, and we are in the prime position to just make make it um, a banned industry so that it, it doesn't come back. But it's almost gone already. Thanks for that. Um, you, um, in your um, overview uh, opening statement, um, as, as Jim Fairley had kind of asked about the fact that there were no vets at, um, at Thornton, and you talked about um, euthanasia, and I just wondered so what would happen. What, how does euthanasia happen at Thornton? I mean, I know you maybe not know, but uh, from others, can blind. But um, so if if a dog was to break its spine on a GBGB track, the vet is there. They will have euthanasol, which is the injectable that would humanely put a dog to sleep. Um, it's worth noting that they also must have a freezer to store dead dogs. So they know that they're going to kill dogs with this industry and they have to have a freezer there. However, if there was a vet there and the dog has a, an, un, uh, um, you know, an unlivable injury, like a, a fractured spine, then the vet would humanely put them to sleep. Um, whilst I'm not advocating that that's a positive, of course, um, if your dog breaks its spine in Thornton, you're... I mean, are you piling that dog into the back of your hot car and trying to find a vet at 7pm on a Saturday night to to euthanise that dog? Are you um, are you trying to find somewhere to, to give it some pain relief in the meantime? Or, as we have anecdotal evidence of, um, are you doing something else to end that dog's life that is not humane because you have no, you have no other tools available? Thank you for that. Uh, bear with me, I've got a few more questions. Um, so the Scottish Government has, and, and you've kind of said this, but I just want to hear a bit more on this. So the Scottish Government has voiced a commitment to ensure sentience is taken into consideration in animal wel welfare. What do you think needs to change in order for greyhounds to be afforded the level of protection they deserve as sentient beings? I don't think there's ever been an argument about the sentience of dogs. I think that um, you know they were, there's other species where there had been an argument about sentience. I think we all understand that dogs are sentient beings, and so many of us have them curled up on the couch beside us. It's just um, you know it's a it's a blind spot that a very very small minority have where they see greyhounds as lesser. We know of people that have their Labrador in the house on the couch and their greyhound in the shed in the garden because it's a racing commodity and your Labrador's your pet. Um, so I, for me, I don't think that um, the wider population ha has um, a great area about the sentience of these dogs or their, um, their value. I think it's only this tiny, tiny minority that still um, participate in greyhound racing. Um, I don't know if you've... <clears throat> no, I think that's covered it. I think we're just we're looking for equality for greyhounds, I guess, um, to be treated alongside all the other animals that are covered by the current legislation. Because with what we see it happening on the tracks, we would argue the current legislation is not working. Because if it was working, there wouldn't be injuries and deaths. And we don't think these injuries and deaths are acceptable. That's the bottom line. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, we can argue about Thornton and we can... Um, we could talk for days on this subject, as I'm sure you uh, can imagine. But the bottom line is, it just doesn't make sense that the current animal welfare provision does not protect greyhounds as sentient animals. One more question. Sorry, one more okay. question. Um, um, thank you for that, uh, Jacqueline. And, and I'm going to um, pick up on something you said. So you actually said in your opening statement that now's the time to act because of, um, you know, for various reasons. I just wonder, you know, what kind of time scale is now in your mind in, in terms of this opportunity because of COVID, because of Shaw Fields closing? I'm not um, too familiar with parliamentary processes, so putting a time scale on it for me is a bit difficult, but I would be looking for some action to happen as soon as possible because we are concerned that Thornton is trying to attract numbers back and that could uh, spur further greyhounds being brought into the country or bred. As Jill said, we don't, we're not aware of any breeders at the moment. Um, in Scotland, but I guess we're kind of on a precipice at the moment, and we've got we can go one way or the other. There is a potential for Thornton to start building their numbers again, which might ultimately make it more difficult to then bring about a ban. There will also be socio-economic impact if that if Thornton is allowed to build up again. 
So now is the perfect time because there aren't those issues to consider to any big scale, basically. Um, the, the, as we said, I mean, and I think the crux of our presentation is that the regulation doesn't work. So why would we bring in regulations to Thornton if the current regulations don't work? Thank you. Thanks. One thing in, in uh, response to that, you're, you're talking about timescales, and you're absolutely right. We we are not parliamentarians, so we don't know what the processes are. Um, but bear in mind that this petition was brought in in 2019, and we're sitting in 2022. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and nothing has happened. I am, I'm concerned that some of the measures that might be um, suggested would be we'll write a letter or you know, we'll, we'll ask somebody to consider adding it into a work plan. Um, the, the, the time that it would take to um, gather evidence, consultations, all of these things, that could be another couple of years. And we've learned, um, we've spoken about how many extra deaths, injuries that would uh, result in. I think for us, when we uh, we spoke to uh, Christine Graham at the Cross Party Group for Animal Welfare, and um, she was very pleased that we'd gone down the route of a public petition because the purpose of public petitions is to give the public an opportunity to bring to the government an issue that doesn't fit somewhere else within the plans, um, and you know, it's the fifth most signed petition. So there's a, a lot of support here for this. Um, we feel that. We've waited so long. There, obviously, some of the delays have been due to um, due to COVID. But one year ago, a letter was supposed to be written to the Animal Welfare Commission, and it didn't happen. So that wasn't COVID related. It, it just wasn't. Maybe it was forgotten or or not taken seriously enough. Um, but we feel that actually bills, changes to the Act are not fast enough. We would really like to see it um, debated in, in the full government in the chamber and go to a vote and, and allow us to use that public petition provision, which should be there for the public to bring an important um, issue to the fore without having to wait four years for a bill. Uh, um, Rachel Hamilton and Beatrice Wishart. Sorry to cover ground that's already been covered, but um, it's really disappointing to to hear from the evidence that the Animal um, Health and Welfare Scotland Act is failing greyhounds. Now, I just want to square something here, because Jacqueline, um, well, Jill, in your presentation, you said no amount of welfare legislation will improve this situation. But Jacqueline, um, you slightly contradicted yourself by saying that if current legislation was improved and greyhounds were treated equally to other racing animals, that we could see an improvement, but then contradicted that in the next question to Ariane. I just wondered, you know, what are we looking at here as, as a committee? We have to be, I suppose, clear because, um, you know, in, in, in answer to Mark Ruskell's question to the Cabinet Secretary, she referred to the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission and their um, attitude is to look at um, licence tracks and unlicensed tracks and, and to understand um, how regulation can improve animal the, the, the rate of animal injuries. So we've got we've got to look from a ban, which is what the Green Party are after. We've got to look at what the Scottish ministers are saying, which they're referring to the Animal Welfare Commission. You know, what do you think, other than um, <laughs> to a you know, two very different routes. What the best way our committee can look at this is, is it looking at the deficiencies of the Animal Welfare, um, Health and Welfare Scotland Act, or is it to look at the merits of a complete ban? I mean, it is definitely to, to look at the merits of a ban. Um, Jacqueline wasn't saying... Um, that greyhounds should be treated equally to other racing animals, as you said. We're meaning dogs, other dogs. There are no other dogs put in that position other than greyhounds in this country. Um, so, no, I, th I think the, the point we're trying to make when we're presenting to you all the data from the, the track that is regulated is that if, if, if the argument was, well, let's bring regulation to Thornton, 
are we saying then we are, we're happy for there to be 18,000 injuries and uh, 3,000 deaths and you know we'll, we'll bring Thornton into the fold because we're happy with that level of abuse and injury death doping um, we're not we don't feel that that's an acceptable position um, so yeah we, we we're not looking for I, I guess I understand what you're saying you know as um, the government might look for a middle ground here but we're trying to explain to you that there isn't a middle ground that would um, that would advocate properly for the greyhounds because arguably then the middle ground would be to make Thornton um, become a regulated track but will that be self-regulation again will we be in a position where they don't actually cooperate with the SPCA they don't cooperate with Police Scotland they don't publish any of their information until months down the line where the evidence has been lost and and would we be putting in place the similar similar level of welfare um, regulations that GBGB has and say, OK, we're happy now with the injuries and the deaths and the doping, because at least we can say we've got a regulatory body. Um, and it's not just the Greens that are um, that are supporting the ban, as you mentioned. I think it's incredibly significant that the SPCA are saying ban it. How can, how can we say let's allow it to carry on when the SSPCA is the body who has the statutory authority um, to investigate and prosecute uh, uh, breaches of the Animal Health and Welfare Act, and they're saying, "But we can't do it because we're not we're not getting in, we're not protecting the dogs. We feel you should ban it." I don't know where we go from there if we allow it to proceed, because the SSPC are saying it's not effective. Yes. And just to just to add to that, on this, um, the Animal Welfare Commission in Scotland, mm. you know, do you think that they are going far enough with what they're they're proposing with a report because they say that um, that they're looking at uh, that, that GBGB only cover licensed tracks to address issues with unlicensed tracks also where the regulation is effective in for example reducing fatalities now if we're stuck at this point you know um, it is our job as a committee to sort of take that even that to take further steps for them to actually look at this in greater detail because if they're looking at that through that narrow lens surely this isn't going to square what your petition is about yes, it's not. it absolutely isn't it's, as far as i'm aware it's not even on their work plan to do this uh, within the, the the current setting so um but I, I suppose i'm just kind of banging the same drum um but it comes down to whether um the government is is happy to accept a level of injuries, death, drugging of dogs. Um, I, I think that it, it just doesn't sit with um, it, it doesn't sit well with us. And I think that any measure short of a ban is is basically saying we're happy to accept this level. Um, but if the SSPC are saying we can't um, we can't provide the protection, then it's it's kind of a moot point to me. I don't I don't understand how we would let it continue. Uh, members, and, and went to some of it, we're, we are running very, we're, we're actually running over time, so can I ask you to keep your final questions as brief as possible? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure this will not be the, the last time you're in front of the, the committee, but uh, Beatrice Wishart and then uh, uh, Karen Adam. Thanks, convener, and thanks, Jill and Jacqueline, for your evidence this morning. It's been quite enlightening. Um, if there is a ban uh, that comes into place, do you think there's a danger of the Support, uh, going underground and and therefore it being more difficult? You could argue that it's underground already, given that we don't know anything about what's going on at Thornton. Um, I would suggest that that is a possibility, I suppose, but if there's um, sufficient legislation in place to actually tackle any tracks that do pop up, then hopefully they would be dealt with. Um, I mean, greyhound tracks are quite large operations. They're difficult to, to hide. So <laughs> I think that might limit um, any kind of underground operations that we see in the future. It's always a possibility, though. But I think the, the point is, at the moment, these tracks could open up and there's nothing to stop them. Um, so a ban would certainly prevent that. Thank you. Uh, Karen Adam. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning, everyone. And, and thank you so much for your um, evidence. That, um, thus far. I, I'd like to touch upon, Jill, you spoke about the petition um, gaining quite a lot of traction and you've also spoke about, did I hear correctly, that you go trackside sometimes. So could you give us some kind of 
um, understanding of what you feel from, from, from your point of view of what public opinion is in regards to greyhound racing? Because they're saying there's only one track now active in Scotland. Um, what, what is the public opinion out there? Um, well, obviously, I mentioned the number of signatures, so we know that the public opinion in terms of um, how many um, back this petition is high. Um, but a, a big part of what SAGE has done for the last three and a half years is um, protests every single Saturday at uh, Shawfield Stadium, and we have also done some protests at Thornton as well. And we, we take a, a counter and we see how many people are going in um, to, the, to the tracks. Um, in Scotland, unlike in England, we don't televise our racing, so um, it doesn't go to bookmakers' uh, televisions or anything like that. So the only people um, that are watching and betting on the racing are the people that walk through the door. Um, and before the pandemic, um, we were at, Th um, at Shawfield on a Saturday night and would frequently get less than 100 people. Um, it has a capacity of 4,000. There used to be 30 tracks in Scotland. Um, the, there is really just the tiniest, tiniest minority of people that are still invested, and, and they are people that were probably racing greyhounds 30, 40 years ago. That's the demographic that we see going in. Um, so in terms of support for the ban, we feel it's high. In terms of footfall at the tracks, it's tiny, and we know that because we've been counting it for the last three and a half years. Um, when we've done a protest at Thornton, you're lucky if there's 30 people. The convener, um, so I, I'm guessing, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of your work is raising awareness as well. Um, how do you have any anecdotal evidence of, you know, t talking to people and raising awareness of this? Do you feel that there is enough awareness? Do you feel that people going to the Greyhound tracks are aware of what is going on? Um, we um, have lots of anecdotal stories of, um, of that kind of thing. We have had people, um, we speak to people outside uh, Shawfield who have turned around and walked away from the track rather than go in because they've been so disturbed by what we have told them. We, we try not to be too emotional in our argument. We try and be fact-based, evidence-based. We um, show people the evidence and we let them make their own mind up. We've never been forceful with any of our opinions and views. It's simply educational. But yeah, we have seen a number of people um, leave, walk out and not be able to go in. We've had staff members from Shawfield stand and uh, speak to us at length about how much they hate working there, but it's a job and they have to do it. So we know the public support's out there. Through all the demonstrations we've done, City Centre Glasgow uh, protests, and we have had a massive amount of support. We take the dogs to these, we let people meet the dogs, we let them engage with them. And a lot of people have never been up close to a greyhound and they seem surprised to find it's actually just a dog um, because they're not treated as dogs. So, yeah, we believe the public support is behind us. And in actual fact, it was 2017 we started the protests at Shawfield. So, yeah, so in five years, we saw the numbers going from probably a couple of thousand going in. We started counting it. Um, the numbers going in, I think, initially was about 300. And over that year, the numbers came down, 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 down to less than 100 people attending the races. The people that are attending or were attending, there were some concerns there in itself because we often saw people going in with babies and buggies, along with um, crowds of drunk men on stag, stag parties. So there was a whole, a whole mix of what we considered inappropriate uh, behaviour in and around that stadium. But as, as far as public support goes, we do believe that we've got that on our side. Thank you. And uh, to close, two very short no, we've got one very short uh, supplementary. I'm, I'm sorry we're, we're running out of time. Alistair. Thanks. Uh, you, you indicated that the interest in Scotland in this, to use their word, sport, seems to be very limited. So I'm just curious to know whether the gambling industry was driving the defence of greyhound racing. And is that the gambling industry in Scotland? or is, is it the, Are people in Ireland betting on this? or wh Where does the incentive come from? to keep going. Racing in Scotland is not... Um, as, so you, you may or may not know about bags racing. So bags racing is where um, races go on behind closed doors and are televised. So you could sit in a bookmaker's all day and just watch dogs going round and bet. Um, we don't have bags racing in Scotland. So people from Ireland can't bet on what's happening in Thornton um, or Shawfield, um, albeit it's now closed. Um, so no, the only people that are betting um, are the people that walk in. And as I say, in Thornton, it is a, um, 
Jack had explained that the track is large, so it couldn't be hidden, but it's a small operation. There's 30, 40 people going in. Um, some of them are children and partners and things like that. So um, there, is no, uh, there is no gambling industry underpinning this now whatsoever. Even when Shawfield was open, um, 100 people placing, some not placing a bet. A lot of people would come on stag do's, birthday parties, retirements, that kind of thing, and say to us, oh, I won't be betting, I'm just here because it's Shuggy's 60th. You know, so the, the, there is no big business here whatsoever. And that's again, ties into why now is the time, because there is no industry. It's, it's just the, the interests of a couple of people that like to, um, to abuse their dogs. Thank you. Uh, Jim has got a very short additional. If you're saying there are so few people turning up, you don't have an online betting system, where's the financial incentive for this to continue? And if regulations were brought in properly, surely the financial side of it would make it an irrelevant pastime to do anyway. I don't think there is a financial incentive now with the, the industry the way it is here. For example, I think if you were to um, force Thornton to uh, employ a vet, then they wouldn't be able to afford that. You know, it's, uh, finances aren't what's driving this. It's, it's, um, it's this age-old um, argument of, oh, but it's tradition. Um, I've, greyhound racing's in my blood. My father raced greyhounds. But that's, that's a really weak argument to allow um, abuse to perpetuate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad we got the, the gambling comments on, on record because I was going to ask whether the Gambling Commission did have a, a remit within this, but it would appear that that, that would be very limited. Um, I, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I know the time uh, constraints, we, we, we could have uh, asked you a lot more questions, but uh, the evidence you provided has been very helpful. Um, the, the paper in front of us uh, sets out a number of suggestions for our next steps. Um, I. I th I'm absolutely aware that the, the letter to the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission wasn't sent. That, that's regrettable. It was certainly something that when we came to this commission, we thought that response would be available to us. Um, members, I, I think we absolutely still need to write to the, the Animal Welfare Commission to ask for further information on its, on its views of the, uh, the welfare of greyhounds in Scotland um, and what consideration it's given to uh, include and prioritise the issue within its work programme. I think we, we need to do that. We've agreed. Um, I think we can also write to uh, Thornton Greyhound Track to ask for information about how it protects the welfare of uh, greyhound racing at its track. Uh, in addition, uh, and I know you, you've already said that uh, you know we can write letters and we could be here in four years' time, I think it's also important that we write to the Scottish Government seeking a, a position statement on the regulation of greyhound racing, given that it appears to be provided for in the, the, 20, uh, sorry, the 2006 Act. And, uh, you know, Mark, ha Mark Ruskell has already raised that. It uh, appears in provision part two of the, the 2006 Act um, to all people who are responsible for animals, including breeders, trainers and owners of racing greyhounds. So I think uh, we could certainly ask the Scottish Government for a, an updated position uh, on that. Is there any other suggestions for what we can do at this stage, Mercedes? Um, could we write to Fife Council and ask them, I don't know if we can ask them to attach conditions to the licensing or to ask them to explore it or look into it. I'm not sure how it works, but it seems if a license is being granted um, to a track that's unregulated, there's scope there to, yeah, to we, add a condition. To I think we can certainly seek further information about the licensing of the track and what their um, involvement and a the situation is with that. I, I should have first have said, I've, I've asked whether members are content to continue the petition, and I presume, I was very presumptuous in assuming that was the case, so we're, we're, we're content to, to progress the petition. Uh, Alistair Allen. Thank you. I think as we uh, continue to look at this, it would be useful to get an indication from the SSPCA as to why they've changed their stance. Um, I think their view on that would be helpful as we continue to look at this. Thank you. Rachel Hamilton. I would like to um, ask Police Scotland uh, why it's so difficult to bring forward um, criminal prosecutions, disqualifications and other such um, provisions that are set out within the Act itself. And I'd also like to know um, from the Gambling Commission if they have a statutory levy that um, supports uh, the welfare aspect of this industry and I do think we ought to hear 
from after the evidence that we've heard from Jill from GBGB? Absolutely, I think we, we, we do need to ask uh, some questions of JB, uh, GB. I think at this point uh, we need to be clear that we were just trying to get uh, a foundation, we're trying to get uh, is, is round a, a picture of what the situation is. Uh, and once we have that information, particularly from the, the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission, that we're in a better position to decide what the next step is uh, and, and what the, uh, the approach to this would be. And that might be to, to call for further written evidence, or it may be to call for uh, uh, oral evidence like we've had here today, but from a, a wider range of stakeholders. Uh, any other? GBGB uh, has sorry, no I'm, I'm afraid it's just uh, members oh, okay. uh, at this point. I'm, I'm apologies. Any, Rachel Hamilton. I, I mean, I'm just responding to Jill's point, but I think it's important that we do get that picture um, as a committee because we are starting this from a, a scratch, I suppose. But the other thing that I, I noted in the Act is that the Scottish Ministers, um, they, they um, set the, the precedent for veterinary inspections on tracks as well. I'd like to hear from the veterinary industry. I mean, I know this is, is going down the line, convener, because we're opening up that as we develop this, but I think it's really important that we get all these aspects and um, a view from the veterinary um, world as well. What, what we, we, we've got to be careful not to do is, is open up to too wide a range of stakeholders, but I think the stakeholders that we've mentioned already are certainly key to this. So we've got animal welfare, veterinary concerns, police, um, the, the greyhound industry themselves, Fife Council and the Animal Welfare Commission. I think that's certainly the, uh, the, some of the most fundamental stakeholders in, in this argument. And then uh, when we get the responses back, we can certainly take a decision on how we take it forward. Can I, can I assure uh, the petitioners and those who are, 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 are watching online that uh, this, this is not kicking into the long grass. We absolutely appreciate we're, we're a year behind where we, we should be. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure I speak for the committee when we are, we are absolutely concerned about animal welfare and we strive for the highest animal welfare conditions. So this is not something that uh, we're going to kick into the long grass. Um, however, there, is, there are timescales we need to work to, uh, and the timescale probably going to be very much about the, the response we get from Animal Welfare Commission. Jim? Yeah. The what we're asked, being asked to do is whether we continue with the petition um, and taking stakeholder evidence across, the, does that turn it into an inquiry? This is a daft laddie question as a new parliamentarian. So does this turn this into an inquiry rather than just a continuation of the petition? Uh, well, well, I think one of the decisions we had to take today was whether we closed the petition or whether we continued looking into it. And the next step, I think, we've all agreed to do is, is to write to the main stakeholders to get some more information back, and then we'll decide whether we, we do a full inquiry, a report, uh, ask for further information from the Scottish Government or so, and that's a decision we can take after we get the initial uh, responses from our the, the letters that we're going to write. OK, any further comments? OK, thank you very much. Uh, we, we're now going to suspend briefly to allow for a changeover in witnesses. Thank you. We'll, we'll re resume at uh, 11.10. Thank you.
Our third item of business today is consideration of the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board Amendment Order 2022 draft. Uh, this instrument is subject to the affirmative procedure and I refer members to paper two of their uh, paper pack, which is on page 10. Um, it's worth flagging up that we're considering a UK SI which has been laid in all uh, UK legislators legislatures, I'm sorry, I always get tongue-tied in that, but which cannot be made in the UK Parliament until it has been approved by the devolved legislatures. Apologies. I welcome uh, Mary McCallan, uh, Minister for Environment, Biodiversity and Land Reform, and our officials uh, for this item, who are Neil McLeod, Principal Legal Officer, uh, Caspian Richards, Head of Policy and Pesticide Survey Unit, Science and Advice for uh, Scottish Agriculture. And I invite the Minister to make uh, an opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener, uh, and thank you all for uh, the opportunity to give evidence today on this draft UK Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board Amendment Order 2022. Um, <clears throat> by way of background, the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board, or AHDB as I'll refer to it, uh, is a statutory levy board uh, funded by farmers, growers and others in the supply chain. Um, it provides services and advice to support and promote our world-class food and farming industry. AHDB comprises six statutory levy-paying sectors um, currently included within the scope of this order, which are uh, cereal and oilseed industries in UK, milk, horticulture and potato in GB, and uh, pig, beef and sheep industries in England. Um, and as you said, convener, the order is a, a UK-wide instrument made in exercise of powers um, conveyed under the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006. On the Secretary of State acting, as you've said, with approval of the Scottish Ministers, um, but the Act also provides that Scottish Ministers may not give that approval without the approval of the Scottish Parliament, and that's why it's before you today. So as to purpose of the order, it's to amend the principal Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board Order of 2008, which established AHDB and is the source of AHDB's functions. And it will amend it so to remove the statutory levies in horticulture and potato sectors in GB. Um, now, this is being done because in January and February of 2021, levy payers in the horticulture and potato sectors triggered a, a democratic ballot on whether they wanted the statutory levy to continue in their sectors. Um, in horticulture, 61% uh, voted against the levy continuing from a turnout of 69%. Of and uh, in potato in the potato ballot, 66% voted against the levy continuing from a 64% turnout. Um, so this instrument therefore gives rise to these democratically expressed views, respect to the outcome of the ballots, and it does that by removing all legislative provisions for the statutory levy in these sectors. Now, in addition to this, it also seeks to improve accountability. Uh, for the remaining levy paying sectors, which I mentioned at the beginning, and it does this by imposing a new duty on AHDB to deliver a regular vote of the levy payers at least once every five years on what their levy will be spent on. And finally, the, instru the instrument introduces a, a final, a third technical amendment, which will clarify that um, AHDB's ability to charge for services includes all industries in scope of the order, and not only those that pay a levy. So this is purely technical. It will ensure that although the statutory levy is being removed for horticulture and potatoes, uh, the rest of the order will continue to apply to these sectors. Um, and it means that businesses in, in either sector could continue to work with the HDB in a voluntary or commercial basis if they decided to. Um, now, as well as the provisions that are contained here, the AHDB amendment order also consulted on a, a further proposal on broadening the scope of AHDB to further agricultural sectors. Um, a majority of respondents in Scotland uh, resisted that proposal, voted against it, and highlighted that AHDB should use this opportunity following the, the vote and the removal of the levy in some sectors to rationalise and to deliver excellence in their service rather than um, expanding that. So that has not been included. But in summary, um, I, I support the changes which the order makes to give expression to the democratic views expressed by horticulture and potato sectors and to introduce greater accountability for the remaining sectors. Um, 
Looking forward, we'll continue to work closely with horticulture and potato as they now work to identify their own priorities and the way they wish to organise themselves out with the scope of the statutory mechanism. Um, this draft order provides the flexibility for them to do this on an individual subsector basis um, and, and we will work with them as they decide what they wish to do. So that's plenty for me, convener. Um, but my officials and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, we will move to questions. C can I ask, um, it was a democratic vote by the potato and horticulture sectors, but what does that vote say about the quality of the services provided by um, AHDB? And, and what impact do you foresee um, the sectors experiencing as, 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 as a consequence of leaving? That it is an indictment on how the horticulture and potato sectors felt they were experiencing value for money, uh, quality of the services provided, and I think also um, accountability for uh, the decisions that were made and, and perhaps what the, the levies were being spent on. Um, and I think that for the remaining sectors within the order, that second provision in this uh, piece of legislation today ought to help improve the circumstances because we have we'll have that vote every five years on what the levy should be spent on um, and as regards the future for horticulture and potatoes out with the, the statutory mechanism i think that um, it's now open to them to decide as as a sector either on a whole sector basis a subsector basis how best they wish to organize themselves what they want to prioritize and as i say the scottish government is is here and, and happy and willing to continue working with them on that Rachel Hamilton. It's just to follow up from Finley's question, the convener's question. But so, despite the decision made through a democratic ballot, um, I just wanted to hear more about the engagement that you'd had um, with the board about how it will impact them reaching out to provide either voluntary or commercial um, services to perhaps those horticultural um, potato growers that previously had their service. Um, does it have an impact on the support that the Scottish Government will have to give to the, um, to the AHDB? So, um, just for, on the first part of your question, um, Rachel, which I think is a, a sound one, so there are um, a number of uh, provisions that AHDB would, would previously have provided to horticulture and potatoes, which I think the sector would... Ha happily say still remain very important, including uh, work on fight against blight, um, aphid monitoring, um, and indeed the um, applications for emergency pesticide use and things like this, which were arranged on a um, on a collective basis previously, and which I think now the conversations will be had about you know how best they wish to do that moving forward. On that, that the last one, you know, you asked about interaction that we have had with them and, and consultation that we've had. Um, in the consultation, I think it was clear that that last um, piece of work on the application of fertilisers was identified as being very important going forward and we'll continue, HDB will continue to provide that until 2023. So we've kind of responded to what was asked for in, in the consultation. But as I say, I feel very strongly that it's important to respond to democratic wishes as they are expressed. And it's now for these industries to agree how they wish to organise themselves. And we and HDB um, and you know, the four nations of the UK um, are here to continue working with them. OK, it's, it's just that obviously the, the, the blight issue and the aphid issue is something that is driven through, you know, um, a, a specific guidance within the potato sector um, that comes from government. So therefore, I suppose it's really important and I would like your reassurance that, you know, you will continue to um, support not only the, um, the board itself, but actually if it comes to the crux where perhaps there could be job losses, for example, um, because we need to make sure that Scotland is at the cutting edge of ensuring that we are, you know, um, tackling blight and tackling disease and ensuring that we don't have a pest um, issue. So I think I, from 
you know, on behalf of the committee, I just hope that we'd have reassurance from the government that, you know, you will keep an eye on this situation. Absolutely give that, that commitment. First of all, I would say I don't anticipate any job losses as a result of the removal of the statutory levy. Um, and then on the point about the continuing uh, support for research and development in these particular areas, as well as marketing, which of course is separate, we're absolutely there to do that. In fact, we recently invested, I think, I think it's 2.2 million in uh, research into potato cyst nematode. Um, and that absolutely continues in our world-class uh, research facilities, including the James Hutton Institute. Um, but I might, I might hand over to Caspian just to see if there's anything else you wanted to add on that point. Um, no, I mean, I think that's that, that's very, very much the, the case that the, the, res the research expertise we have in Scotland um, at, at the, the James Hutton and others is, is fundamental to that. And obviously we support that through um, the strategic research programmes we fund. Um, but um, yes, I mean, their, their, their ability to provide those services um, is kind of fundamental to the long-term solution, I'm sure. But um, so we, we wait to see what um, comes out from the industry discussions as to what form um, they think that would take and, and again, how we can support that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mercedes Villalba. Thank you. Um, yeah, good morning. Thanks very much for coming down. Um, I wondered if you could let us know what your understanding, or the Scottish Government's understanding is, of how the UK Government reached the decision um, to require the Board to hold a regular vote at least once every five years and not more frequently than that. Thank you for the question. Um, so, first of all, it wasn't a, it's not necessarily a UK government decision. Um, it's, it's joint government's decision. So, just to give you a bit of um, background on how this happened. So, I think it was 2021, uh, growers in Lincolnshire gather enough people together to trigger a ballot. That ballot takes place. They vote, um, as I set out in the opening remarks, in, in majority to remove the ballot. There is then a, a consultation which was um, developed by UK government and by ourselves which spoke to some of the questions that were part of the ballot and some of the wider questions and within that was the point about how do you ensure con account greater accountability for the remaining um, sectors. And just on the point about um, that, that provision which will allow for a, a, a vote every five years, that's at least every five years. And um, the, the HDB have already committed to doing so more frequently. And I expect the first one will be, I think, April 2022. Oh, that's, that's yeah. mm. Sorry, Caspian, uh, please, um, I'll, I'll allow you to come in. But it's at least every five years, and I would expect it to be more often than that. But please do. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, they, they, they actually, um, AHDB has gone out for the first time to the continuing sectors as part of that, that exercise just now. So it's actually just literally opened at the moment to growers in those sectors. So do you think, or does the Scottish Government think that more regular voting will improve transparency and accountability like more regularly than the five years? It sounds like you, you would be supportive of more frequently. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I... Within reason, I support as frequent and as broad and as deep consultation as, as is possible with those who are um, paying for, for, for the levy and paying for the services which AHDB provide. And so then, if levy payers reject the proposals that are brought forward by the board um, on how the levy is going to be spent, um, then how can the, the levy payers influence the proposals can can they make counter proposals or what's the what's the process for them that's a good question i'm not sure that i have the detail today on exactly what would happen if in one of those votes the the levy pairs rejected the proposals but i'm more than happy to go away and come back on that point thank you yeah that would be most helpful if, if you could come back to the committee and write on, on that uh, that question that'd be useful uh, alistair allen yeah, thank you convener um just ask really briefly um in your interaction with the potato and horticulture sectors on some of these issues that you've mentioned, um, has the government been alive to some of the wider challenges that those sectors have faced? I, I think inevitably perhaps of EU exit, but are there others as well? Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a tumultuous time uh, for the sectors. We, particularly since EU exit, when of course, at the stroke of a pen, uh, the UK government's uh, Brexit deal ended the Scottish seed potatoes market for uh, trade into the EU. 
virtually overnight. Um, so myself and um, the Cabinet Secretary, Mary Goujon, and our officials, we meet regularly on a roundtable basis with uh, the potato and horticulture sector to, on an ongoing basis, understand their concerns and how we can address them. Um, to date, these are largely centering on tr trading opportunities post-Brexit. As I've just mentioned, the EU market has been cut off overnight. Um, the availability of workforce, but it's largely a lack thereof, um, and indeed um, <clears throat> supply chain disruption, which Brexit has had a huge impact on, but so too has the pandemic and other, um, other global issues. Um, now, most of these most of these areas are reserved. We are in almost contact, uh, con constant contact with uh, the Home Office, with the UK government, making representations on behalf of the, the Scottish sector. I think that um, responses have been very disappointing so far, um, but we will continue to make representations to them. In the meantime, uh, we're supporting in the way that we can for example, in R&D and, and some of the ways that I mentioned to, to Rachel Hamilton, investing in research into um, blight and other uh, pests that cause problems for the industry. Thank you. Okay. Um, just, just on that, you, you mentioned seed potatoes. Can you give us your, your view on just exactly where the, the problem lies with Scottish seed potatoes? Is it a UK government's position or is it an EU position on why seed potatoes are not able to be exported the way they were? Yeah, no, I'm happy to answer that question, albeit I don't think that's within the remit of what we're here to discuss today. It. No. Yes, I did, right, um, okay. but it's, I'm happy to answer it. Um, the, it's a problem of dynamic alignment. Um, it's a failure of uh, reaching agreement prior to Brexit taking place. Um, and, you know, that's undoubtedly the case. What we need to focus on now is finding solutions. Solutions, I hope, which will allow uh, the Scottish producers to continue to trade with the EU and equally at the same time finding alternative trading routes in the rest of the world. And we require both the UK government and the EU to um, get round the table and to make progress on that. Oh, thank you. Any further questions? OK, um, we now move on to our fourth agenda item, which is the formal consideration of the motion to approve the instrument. And I invite uh, Ms McCallan to move motion for S6M-03604, uh, that the Rural Affairs Island and Natural Environment Committee recommends that the Agriculture and Horticultural Development Board Amendment Order 2022 draft be approved. Thanks, convener. Formally moved. Thank you. Does any member wish to debate the motion? No. Uh, if the committee is content to recommend approval of the instrument, can you uh, please uh, indicate by raising your hand? Thank you. Uh, finally, is the committee content to delegate authority to me to sign off our report on our deliberations on this affirmative SI? Thank you. Uh, that completes consideration of the affirmative instrument, and I thank the Minister and our officials for attending today. We now move on to Agenda Item 5, which is consideration of consent notifications for two UK, UK statutory instruments. Uh, the Common Agricultural Policy Cross-Compliance Exemptions and Transitional Regulation Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2022 and the Cytosanitary Conditions Amendment No. 2 Regulations 2022. And I refer members to Paper 3 from page 16. Does any member have any comments on these instruments? No. Are uh, members content to agree to the Scottish Government's decision to consent to the provisions set out in the notifications being included in the UK rather than the Scottish subordinate legislation? Content. Thank you. And that concludes our business in public, and we will now move into private session. <laughs>